Howdy. How's everybody tonight? Alrighty. Hope everybody brought some pen and paper tonight. I could probably do this without notes, but I really would not trust myself with it. All right. I'd like to welcome everybody to Apologetics 101. I want to go ahead and I want to start by telling you guys the goal of what I'm going to be teaching you for the next unknown amount of time. Okay, God has not really revealed to me how long this is going to take to go over all this stuff, how long we're going to, or how much time we're going to dedicate to practicing it and learning it. Okay, I'm going to start by telling you guys a story. In the book, there's a guy, his name is Paul. I'm sure you guys have heard of him. He wrote most of the New Testament. There's a point where the Jews in Israel, or basically he goes up to uh, the temple to, um, what's that word? Yes, but he had to pay. Um, he had to pay the taxes so that the Greeks could were basically converting, so that they could go into the temple. Is essentially what was happening. And when he went in, he was basically they caught him and took him before the uh, high priests, saying that he is unclean and so on and so forth. When actually he already did all the ritual cleansing, he did everything that was needed. Even the Greeks, they were cleansed and everything, and they were basically converting to Christianity, but they were abiding by Jewish law. So Paul was arrested and taken before uh, I never remember that guy's name, the the guy who was in control of that of, Israel, of uh, Jerusalem at that point in time, the Roman. Um, basically, the, uh, the Jews say they make their vow, we're going to kill him, he gets sent off to the governor. The Jews show up at the governor's mansion, palace, whatever it was called, and they proceed to make their accusation. They took a lawyer with them. That's not actually their word for it, but that's modern day. It's called a, we call it a lawyer. They took a lawyer with them so that he could sit there and accuse Paul as per Jewish law. It was sort of contradictory because Romans didn't care about Jewish law. As long as they weren't breaking Roman law, they didn't care. Do with them as you will. But if you recall in that story, Paul basically exposed that he was a Roman citizen. So that changed the story. He's no longer subject to certain things. It's not because it's not he is an actual born Roman citizen. He didn't buy it. He was born Roman. So by that, he had certain rights under Roman law. It's the same thing in America, although we don't apply it anymore. I mean, if your feet are on American soil, you now have all the same rights. But that's something else entirely. Um, but back then, they actually abided by the law. Go figure. Even the Romans abided by the law. Look at all the things they did. It's incredible. Like laws are for a reason or something. So, the lawyers show up and the Jews show up and they start falsely accusing Paul. They have no witnesses. All they have is a lawyer with his fancy words. And the lawyer begins his statement to the governor, Oh, wonderful Felix. Now, the Jews have no love for the Romans whatsoever. None. So, he's literally blowing smoke up Felix's hind end. That's all he's doing. All these flattery, 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 flattery. Flattering words over and over and over again. Would you please be the judge? And then he accuses Paul. After accusing Paul, Felix nods. He's like, yeah, whatever. And that's how I see it anyway. And then he looks over at Paul and says, go. Paul, there's no flattery in Paul's words whatsoever. He acknowledges that Felix has governed the area for a long period of time. And he says, I would be happy to present my um, apologia. That is the Greek word. The word he uses is apologia. Apologetics. From Greek, speaking in defense. It is, the def it is the discipline of defending a position, often religious, through the systematic use of information. Lee's paraphrase. The ability to defend what you believe effectively. When you come across somebody, they don't believe in God. They say, why do you believe in God? Because I do? What's the reason? Is it by faith alone? Well, you can't, you can't truly believe in God. You can believe in him by faith first. But can you explain what caused that faith? And that is where your apologetics come into play. Now, there are several other factors that go with the, the apologetics. But for tonight, we're only going to focus on two. We're going to start with the basics of the basis of apologetics. 
I am working on mine to the level so that I could literally debate somebody. If an, if an atheist approaches me, I can literally engage in debate. But here's the interesting thing. The Bible, you cannot use the Bible to debate an atheist. The Bible is not in your arsenal. It doesn't do you any good. Does the word of God mean anything if you don't have faith in God? No. It's just a book. Those are just letters. It is not the inspired word of God. So if for a mind that does not understand, it is the inspired word of God. It is his word to us. How can you use it as a defense for anything? It's pointless. So what does that leave you with? Well, specifically for atheists, you have to rely on apologetics, but not biblical apologetics. You have to use scientific apologetics. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail. Not great detail, but I'm going to give you guys some examples. Frank Turek um, and Dr. William Lane Craig have become very good at this. They debate atheists regularly. What you have to understand is that these men have doctorates. They are doctors of philosophy. They have spent so many years doing this, it's absurd. It's a fascination for them. They love it. It is their passion in life. And it has to be to have a doctorate in psychology. I tried to help a friend with psychology once. I'm a pretty smart guy. None of it made sense. Not a lick. I'm like, what is this good for? The problem with a professional apologist, which are those guys who have their doctorates, the problem with them is when you get to that point of knowledge where you have so much of it, your mind is instinctively and intuitively trying to use as much of your knowledge as you, as you, as you can. That way that knowledge doesn't go to waste and you don't forget it. The, bad, the downside to that is you're speaking so far above people's heads that they no longer comprehend what it is you're saying. Earlier today, this morning, I was listening to Dr. Jane, or Dr. William Lane Craig doing an, excurs doing an excursus. I don't even know what an excursus is. I understand it contextually, within the context of what it means. But I don't understand the word itself. I don't see the need for it. I'm not trying to reach that level. I'm not studying for a doctorate in philosophy. So for me, it's not that important. But it makes a good example and listening to it, he starts going on about a lot of things. There's the cos cosmological argument and all these other arguments out there. And literally, you almost have to immerse yourself in philosophy. Who in this room wants to do that? There's my point. We don't want to be able to do that. We just want to be able to effectively defend why we believe what we believe. Who here can tell me what argument do we possess that we can use against an atheist to, de to define or to explain why do we believe what we believe. It's two words. Anybody? That is correct. What do we call that? It's our testimony. Okay? Our testimony is the only defense we have. If I had the time to read it to you guys, I would read you my response to the debate I had with an atheist on my Facebook page. My Facebook page serves two functions. I get updates from Fox News just so I have some idea if anything important happens that I need to go research and to debate people. That's it. It's only, it's only two purposes right now for me. I don't even talk to anybody unless it's, at least within the last two weeks, it's been to engage in debate in one form or another. The significance of a testimony is it's not based on science, it's not based on spirituality, it's not based on anything except your own experience with God. And based on your personal experience with God, no human, no atheist, agnostic, no nothing, they cannot dispute it, they cannot refute it. You cannot refute something you have no knowledge of. If they were not there, they cannot make with any accuracy a statement. It does not mean they don't have that does not mean they have to believe it. It just states that it's something that they can't refute. There's no test to see if someone's testimony is true or not. No more than there's a test to see if God exists or not. If there was a test for that, a simple test like, okay, we're going to do some mathematical, oh, God must exist. 
personally, I think that test actually is real, but the scientific community won't accept it. So what you have, it basically, it's the only real weapon you have. There are other things out there that will require a great amount of study to actually use, like the fine-tuning argument. The fine-tuning argument, in a nutshell, I'm going to paraphrase it, it, it states that basically everything in existence is exactly where it has to be if you change any one factor in any of it it all falls apart for example stars stars in order for stars when stars came into existence if you change the ratio of what created them by one part in 10 to the 16th power. Okay? The ch basically what that's saying, I'm going to break that down a little more. It's 0 .001 if you change just that much out of 10 with 16 zeros after it. Who can tell me what that number is called? A lot. <laughs> that I know of, we don't have a name for that number. I haven't looked for that num the name, a name for that number, but that I know of, there isn't one. That's a big number. You change just one part, that one number, and stars either faded too fast or they would have collapsed it on themselves. It's perfect. It didn't just happen. It happened perfectly. Our universe the Milky Way, our, our universe, okay? Same concept. One part in 10 to the 55th power. You thought 16 zeros was a lot? Now, that's my understanding of how that math works out, okay? I'm not a mathematician. I could be stating some part of that ratio wrong, but it's... It, it's pretty close one way or the other. Now, mathematicians figured these things. How they did it, I can't tell you. Okay? This is one of those things where if you really want to be able to use this as an argument, you have to go and study it. Okay? I may teach on fine tuning, but I have a lot to learn. And it would take an awful long time to really teach all the concepts on how the mathematicians worked out their math and everything like that. Okay? I'm not at that level yet. Plus, I have another viewpoint for apologetics, and it's where I believe they err whenever I listen to some of these debates. They spend most of their time in the, in the debate, okay? They spend most of their time quoting what other people said. Think about that for a second. You're telling me your proof is what a man who is not perfect said. That's what you're going with. You're going to take what an imperfect man said and you're going to stand on it to be factual. I'm sorry. For me, I have a hard time accepting that. As a Christian, there's only one infallible document in existence. Okay? And it isn't something some imperfect man wrote. It's the word of he who sacrificed his son so that I might live and have eternity with him. That's it. So if you're going to, people who want to have arguments with me, when they start quoting people to me, I'm like, I don't care. I don't care what he said. Who's he? Who's he to me? Which comes under the definition of an authority. People hear the word authority, they think somebody who is superior or in charge of them. No. That is one use of the word. But an authority on a topic, what that's saying is it's somebody who you trust. I trust Pastor Keith. On, as an authority on the Bible because God has called him to that position. Pastor Keith has spent so many years studying the Bible, teaching the Bible. He's an authority on the word of God to me. Pastor Dell is an authority on the word of God to me because I trust them. Somebody's name I never heard of